بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم. I'd also like to say that uh, I have no particular expertise on the history or role of women in the United Methodist Church. So I was very grateful for this opportunity, which came as an invitation to me to study and learn more about my own faith tradition. And I know that's exactly in keeping with the values and the goals of this organization. So I'm delighted to participate. Having said that, though, um, I have been a woman in professional ministry in this denomination for over 35 years, and I do have my own experience to bring to bear. As I thought about this topic, I knew without a doubt that I would have to begin at the very beginning with the life of one woman in particular who was a unique influence on the perspective of the denomination's founders. And she is Susanna Wesley, the mother of John and Charles Wesley, the founders of the Methodist movement, which began within the Anglican Church. Susanna became the wife of Samuel Wesley in 1688 in England, and together they had 19 children, <laughs> nine of whom died in infancy, the day after each child turned five years old, Susanna began their formal education with six hours a day spent in lessons, including the daughters being taught. On Sunday afternoons, Susanna assembled her children for the singing of songs and for the hearing of the sermon which she delivered. Up to 200 local people began attending her services because the Sunday morning preacher, in quotations, lacked the diversity of spiritual teaching, which Susanna's services provide. Susanna's husband, Samuel, who was a rector at the Epworth Church and who had been away for some time while Susanna assumed this man's role as a preacher, challenged Susanna to justify her actions. She responded that she believed the life of the church hung in the balance and no other course of action was left open to her other than to take action. So her son John, who was nine years old at the time, had a very powerful example of the kind of leadership women might exert in church and it would influence the role women would eventually have in the development of his Methodist movement. Methodism began as a revival movement within the Protestant Church of England in the 1730s. While attending Oxford University, John and Charles began their holy clubs, which adhered to disciplined <coughs> prayer, study, and service schedules. The name Methodist stuck, though it originated as a derogatory term that students at Oxford used to ridicule the rigorous methods and structures employed by the Holy Club. As Holy Clubs grew into Methodist societies and the movement spread to North America, women participated in large numbers. Though John Wesley did not encourage women to preach except under extraordinary circumstances, he did recognize their leadership in a variety of other ways. This kind of ambivalence toward embracing women's full authority to lead in the church has remained embedded in our denomination, and of course has also been changing significantly over the past 250 years. It wasn't until 1956 that women received full clergy rights in the Methodist Church. Today, women account for approximately 60% of total church membership and roughly 30% of clergy positions. Here I have to say that in the United Methodist Church, there are two distinct orders for clergy, elders and deacons. 
Both require seminary training and passing the scrutiny of certifying boards. However, their roles are different. Elders carry the authority to lead or solo, uh, to lead or be solo pastors in local churches. Elders preach, they administer the sacraments, and they are responsible for ordering the life of the congregation. Deacons, on the other hand, serve in team ministry with elders in local churches or in settings outside the local church, such as hospitals or nonprofit organizations, connecting local churches to the needs of the world. The Order of Deacon was established in 1996, so it's relatively new, and provides clergy status for those who carry on a legacy begun by lay professionals in specialty fields such as Christian education, music, and outreach ministry. But the Order of Elder can trace its roots back to John Wesley's ordination of men for service in North America in the 1700s. In 2014, 76% of all those ordained as deacons were women, and 80% of elders were men. I'm a deacon, and my colleague, Pastor Henry Kim, is an elder. As is always the case in women's leadership development, having role models who are women has immeasurable value. I chose Christian education as my profession because I felt called to ministry and I was influenced in powerful and delightful ways by Maydale Hares, the children's ministry specialist at the church my family attended in Texas. I'll never know if I would have chosen ordination on the elder track if Maydale had been the pastor rather than the Christian educator. But that was Texas in the 1970s. And what's important to note is that the United Methodist Church looks very different in the Western United States, and particularly here in California, than it does in the Southeastern United States. The race and gender divide is much more pronounced in places like Mississippi and Virginia, Alabama and Texas, for instance, than it is in California. In 1984, Bishop Leontine Kelly was elected the first black woman to become bishop in any Christian denomination. And she was elected by the Western jurisdiction of the United Methodist Church after she had withdrawn her name with great disappointment from consideration in the Southeast where her, where her home church was because it was clear she could not be elected there. The United Methodist Church is an institution that reflects the racism and sexism and homophobia, don't get me started, <laughs> of the context in which it lives. It also contributes its own layers. A clergy sister once told me that on the first Sunday she led worship in a small church in the Central Valley of California as the first woman pastor in its history. The organist, rather than playing a hymn or a piece of sacred music, played the theme song from the Miss America pageant as she processed down the aisle to Indian worship. <coughs> in the decades since women were first ordained elders, they have faced many challenges as they have sought to carry their authority authentically. They have consistently asked themselves, how do I take authority while leading in a way that empowers others? Over the years, as women have continued to live their answers to that question, it has become a foundation for a leadership style shift throughout the whole church. Today, as membership in the United Methodist Church and in other mainline Protestant denominations in the United States continues to decline, and as upkeep for aging church buildings becomes more difficult, innovative young clergy are creating new ways of seeing the church 
by returning to relationship and hospitality as the heart of ministry. House churches are forming around bread baking ministries, caregiving ministries, and workplace based ministries are inviting seekers to an experience of church that holds promise for them and is not the style of church their grandparents attended. I think the influence of women in ministry has been a significant contributing factor to this kind of attentiveness to the changing needs of society. I also think that generally, historically, the new contributions of women in the church have been mostly resisted at every step and only more fully appreciated in, in hindsight and as more and more women have become leaders in the church in prominent ways. Women in the church have been and continue to be bringers of food to potluck suppers, visitors to the sick, the preparers of wedding and memorial service receptions, committee members, worshiping in the pews, teaching Sunday school, leading small groups, directing choirs, printing bulletins, answering phones, advocating for justice, speaking prophetically, and pastoring churches. It remains to be seen what new roles and new ways of being in ministry women will create and assume into the future. Pretty impressed with the uh, with the turnout. Um, with that said, I the, the topic for tonight's talk um, is really something I wanted to first focus on before I actually get into the talk, because um, I'm sure it's been repeated, but what is the role of women in your faith, right? And how has it evolved over time? The wording here is important uh, because the focus is on the faith, right? In my experience, especially uh, post 9-11, with a lot of the rhetoric that's been you know, sort of uh, permeated in our, in our culture and our society about Islam and Muslims, I found that I'm often in a position where I'm very defensive about not so much what my faith says, of what the people who claim to share my faith do. And so I really value opportunities like this where I can actually focus on what the actual faith teaches as opposed to having to explain what other people might do, right? Because many times, for example, I've been asked, um, why can't women in Saudi Arabia drive, right? Or um, I'm from Afghanistan, I was born in Afghanistan. So why can't, why, why can't girls or women in Afghanistan get an education? And so again, I have to, you know, defend, well, that's not, that's nothing to do with my faith. It has to do with the fact that, unfortunately, people who again claim to be acting on behalf of my faith are not acting on behalf of my faith, and they have um, usurped the rights of, of individuals. And, you know, it's off into a different tangent. So, anyhow, like I said, I really appreciate the fact that I can actually just focus um, you know, the, talk, the, the talk today on, on what Islam actually says. And this topic, especially about Muslim women, is really um, one of my favorite topics to talk about. I, I speak regularly on different topics because it takes me back to my own uh, journey coming into the faith. See, I was born into a Muslim family, a very conservative, uh, conservative, I would say, culturally conservative family. It wasn't quite religious. We weren't really practicing, but we had a very strong identity um, as, as cultural Muslims. And so it wasn't until my first year in college when I actually started, um, I think, having maybe an existential or spiritual crisis and started asking a lot of questions <coughs> about my existence, um, my purpose. I lost my grandfather, so that was the very first sort of, um, you know, experience of reality about thinking about existence. But after that, I had another incident at the school that I attended, where um, I was actually asked to uh, gather or kind of rally around uh, uh, some, some Muslims to come to a talk on campus where there would be a female speaker and she was going to talk about 
uh, female genital mutilation. She was, she, I was told by the, uh, the, the, the teacher or the professor at the time that she was a Muslim woman and it would be really nice to have members of the Muslim Student Association come and attend and just support her and you know to, to be there for her. So I, you know, I was at, actually at that time very active in, in the club and the Muslim Students Association. So I asked some friends to join me and we attended the talk uh, to go and help and support her, but we found that she had actually left Islam and she began to talk about um, sort of her own personal feelings, you know, things that she had conflicts with, but also saying things that were categorically just wrong and flat out untrue. And so I found myself in a position of having to speak out and, you know, um, and kind of question what she was doing, and it kind of turned into this moment, like I felt like it was kind of like the twilight zone, where I, I really remember that moment because there was an audience full of um, mostly women, and, um, and they were there to obviously also support her. But when they saw me speaking out against her, they kind of, you know, they felt like, they, they felt like, like I was offensive, although I didn't say anything necessarily offensive, I was just more defending my faith. But at, in that moment when I, saw the response of the audience, I started thinking about who am I, you know, what's my identity as a Muslim woman, because I didn't uh, cover as I do now, I wasn't doing my five daily prayers, I wasn't really, you know, embodying all the, the things that I believed, but I just, I just hadn't arrived at that place where I wanted to really seriously put my faith into practice. So when I saw that reaction, and I, you know, I, I just was in that moment of thinking about deep, you know, reflection about who am I, what's my identity, that sort of sparked my journey into studying not just my own faith, but also other faiths as well. So I started actually shifting my studies into religious studies, and I took, you know, different um, courses on, on all the world religions. But when I landed on Islam, it was revelatory for me, because I didn't realize how many prejudices and misconceptions I carried about the role of Muslim women, um, and things that, you know, even growing up in a Muslim family that I thought, um, that I later found out were very cultural practices, they were all kind of, you know, again, coming to light as I started studying the faith. For example, the first thing that I remember, um, you know, I read a list that had a comparison uh, of all the rights that Muslim women were given 1400 years ago compared to women from other faith traditions or just you know around the world and one of the first things um, that the list mentioned was the right of Muslim women to marry and to divorce you know all on their own now by show of hands please work with me here how many of you have all have been led to believe that Muslim women do not have choice when it comes to marriage and divorce, right? Very good. So again, this is something that in that list I started you know, reading more and more, but there's a story that I'd like to share. One of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad, um, his name was Ibn Abbas. Ibn just means son, so the son of a man named Abbas. He relates that once a, a young girl, she came to the Prophet Muhammad, and she had just been married off forcibly by her father, and she was very upset. So she came to complain to him. Now, in that moment, the prophet, you know, the marriage ceremony had already happened. So he paused, and he, and again, this is important to uh, to reflect on what you know how he engaged her. He asked her, "Now that this has happened, you have a choice. Do you wish to stay in this marriage, or do you wish to leave the marriage?" Her response was, "What do you think?" Throw out some guesses. How many people think she said, I want out, bring me out of this? You know, she complained, right? Okay, how many people think she stayed? All right, have you read this? <laughs> she, she actually said, I do wish to stay, but the reason I spoke up is so that I let other women know that no man has the right to force them into a marriage. So this story to me was really profound because not only is she exercising her own you know, choice, right, in the matter, but she's also clearly showing that she is looking out for other women, and so she made a really responsible decision to speak out. She could have just 
you know, kept quiet and gone to the, and stayed in that marriage without anybody ever knowing that she had a problem with it. But she wanted to make a, a clear point. And the fact that that was related to, you know, not just one story of many that dispel this myth that Muslim women cannot marry or divorce. And that's one, like I said, of many. But another uh, right that, again, just, you know, that, 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 that might surprise you is that Muslim women have a right to an education. Um, again, by show of hands, I mean, I come from Afghanistan, we went through the war, we've heard it all, we've seen it all. I think there's a very common perception or misconception that girls, especially in, in, in Muslim countries, are deprived of an education, and this might be somehow rooted in the faith, right? Have you ever been led to believe that? Okay, so again, another saying of the Prophet Muhammad, he said, the seeking of knowledge is obligatory upon every Muslim. And there's no distinguishing there about male, female, or even age or background. It's just a, just a very simple statement. But what that you know tells us as Muslim women especially is that at any point in your life, uh, you have the right to learn. You have the right to go and do whatever you want to pursue, however, you know, whatever your dreams are. Um, and it's not just, you know, the, there's no uh, limits, you know, that it's only, this message is only for young girls or single girls. So as someone who's married and I have children, I, you know, this is really important to me because yeah, currently, yes, I, children are here, you might see them in the back, I'm a stay-at-home mom, but I do have hopes to go back and possibly finish uh, some school, uh, schooling that I, I, I want to pursue. And so it just, again, invalidates this point that this is a myth that unfortunately has been you know, perpetuated. Um, but another right that might surprise you is that Muslim women have the right to own property, to work, and to earn their own income. Um, and there's, I mean, in, in Islamic law, there's so much about um, the rights of women with regards to this. But one thing that I remember being really impressed by is that a, a Muslim woman, whatever income she receives by working, is her own income. So there's no obligation on her to actually contribute to the household, and she can do with it whatever she wants. Men, I'm sorry to say, <laughs> that's not <laughs> the case for the for, for Muslim men. They actually that the, the duty and the responsibility to carry the household is on the man in Islam, so they do have to work, and their income is to go to the household. So there's, you know, this, this is something that, again, a lot of times surprises people. It surprises people to find out that Muslim women have the right in their marriage contract to actually stipulate if they want, uh, for example, someone to come and uh, cook meals for them or clean their homes. They can actually make those stipulations in their marriage contract. But these are all ways to, again, honor the rights and the needs of women, especially once we have children, as many of you, I'm sure, here know if you have children or grandchildren. It's a lot for a, a single woman or a woman to do it all by herself. And they say it takes a village, but unfortunately, I'm sure you've seen that the village has sort of disappeared, right, in modern times. And so you have all these women carrying, you know, not one, two, three, multiple children um, on their own. And so it becomes really hard for them, whereas, here in, in, in our tradition, this was taken care of, you know, before women even had, you know, uh, had children, and that they were given that right to say, you know what, if these are things that concern you, you can stipulate that, and if it's in the marriage contract, then the man has to honor it. So again, another thing that people are surprised to find out um, about Muslim women, they have the right to vote, right? I mean, here in this country, suffrage women, right, 1920s, we got the right to vote. 1,400 years ago, Muslim women were given the right to not only have you know, rights to, to participate in elections, but actually to be elected, to be nominated into political office. And we have so many examples throughout history of female leaders. And, and, uh, and I, we're going to actually, I'll list a few for you in a little bit. But just something that people don't know often about, you know, historically, uh, the position of Muslim women. Another right, they have the right to be respected and treated well. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad in the saying said, the best of you are those who are best in treatment uh, to their wives. And there's, this is just one statement, but many other stories that relate this importance of really honoring the position of a woman in society, uh, a woman in her house. So a lot of things that people, again, um, don't know. But like I said, in my own journey, these were things that I was surprised to find out because, you know, Culturally, things are not always in line with the faith, and this is something that 
as someone who now speaks on the tradition, I have to, you know, again, always kind of clear up for people that there's things that you might find out or hear or see and witness that are expressions of maybe someone's personal beliefs, someone's cultural beliefs, but that's not in the tradition, in the, in the, in the faith itself. Um, just to kind of, uh, I don't know how much time I have, but I'd like, I wanted to just present some famous Muslim women in history to give you clear examples of, of, of how these women exercise their rights. Um, Khadija bin Khuwailid is the first wife, or was the first wife of the Prophet Muhammad, um, peace be upon him. But she, her reputation preceded him. She was known as a very wealthy and very intelligent um, uh, businesswoman. She was entrepreneurial. She actually had, um, she was a tradeswoman, so she had a business of tra selling and trading goods. That, um, and she employed men, mostly men, who would travel as far as Syria on her behalf. And to be a woman in pre-Islamic Arabia at that time doing something like that was pretty extraordinary. But it just, she's an exemplar in, in the faith and she's considered one of the four perfect women that, um, that we study in terms of just her story. But she, even after, uh, you know, he, he received prophecy at the age of 40, they were married at that time, but even after Islam, she continued to uh, use her wealth in extraordinary ways to help um, to help Muslims, and, and, and so she was in her own right a very established like, a woman, and she's an icon of, of the faith. Um, there's another woman, her name is Um Amara, and she was also a female companion of the Prophet Muhammad. She was actually went to, to join one of the, the great battles at that time as a nurse to tend to some of the wounded, but she found herself on the front lines of the battle. So she's kind of one of those warrior women who just went right out there and you know fought, and she was she's another amazing example. We have um, Fatima al fihri She was a, a ninth century um, a woman who established the Qarawin mo uh, Mosque in Fez, Morocco, which is actually considered to be the very first university in the world. This was done by a Muslim woman. So again, things that people don't associate with Islam, first of all, but then with Muslim women are things that are like this. We have Lubna of Cordoba. She was an Andalusian, Andalusian intellectual and mathematician of the second half of the 10th century. And she was famous for her knowledge of grammar and the quality of her poetry. We have Maryam al astro al Egidia. It's a, a title because she was a great mathematician and scientist who worked on astrolabes, which again was in the 10th century invented by, by Muslims. Zainab al Shahda from the 12th century, she was a great calligrapher and teacher. Razia Sultana from the 13th century, who was the first female Sultan of Delhi. Uh, Queen uh, Amina of Zarya of the 16th century, and she was known for her military expertise, uh, especially her brilliant military strategy and in particular engineering skills in erecting great walled camps during her various campaigns. So she's actually credited for doing something that um, our own president has not yet been able to do. She <laughs> built a wall. <laughs> the famous Zarya wall in Nigeria. So I think we need to let him know about her. <laughs> Um, but there's so many other extraordinary examples throughout history of Muslim women who've done amazing things that again, just kind of show the role of women in Islam has been pretty consistent from the onset. It's a matter of, you know, I, you know having that strength of knowing who you are, knowing what God expects of you, and then acting on it. Um, so when this question was posed about how has the role changed um, in Islam for women, I, I would say in my lifetime, honestly, it hasn't necessarily changed in Islam. It's been consistent. But in terms of uh, Muslim women in the public you know, sphere, yes, it's changed. You know, when I started uh, speaking publicly about 20 years ago, you know, there was, um, in, in our local mosques and our Islamic organizations, we'd have, you know, um, talks just like this, or banquets, or, you know, dinners where they would have speakers uh, that would come and present, and very few women were doing it at that time. This was just about 20 years ago or so. Um, ironically, though, when I was training to be to do uh, to become a speaker, I was actually trained under two uh, women who are still here in the Bay Area. They're amazing um, uh, women. They do a lot of interview work, and you might have actually heard of them because they they are you know sort of the trailblazers in terms of 
Muslim Interfaith Work in America. Their organization is called Islamic Networks Group. <laughs> You've heard of them? Yes, there you go, I have some. But uh, Maha el Jumeidi and Amina Jandali, they're personal friends of mine, I actually worked for IMG for uh, a couple of years. But they're amazing women. They're, they kind of started, you know, a little a shift. You know, there was definitely a shift that I personally witnessed where more and more uh, women started training and becoming comfortable speaking not just to female only audiences, which was a little bit more common, but in audiences like this where we'd actually come and talk. And so now you can find hundreds of, of uh, female Muslim speakers everywhere. In addition to you know, just, you know, speakers who do this type of work, we also have uh, famous women. I mean, just last week, I, if you were paying attention to the pol political scene, you know, right? We had two, uh, our very first two Muslim women uh, in, in the House of Representatives, right? Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib. So these are just two examples, but in addition to them, we have so many other people that you might not even know were Muslim that are in the fields of journalism, film, media, music. Um, even, uh, you know, we had uh, our first uh, US Olympic commencer who represented the United States, and she was in full hijab. You know, full cover, Gibbs Hajj Muhammad in 2016. So there's so many examples of Muslim women that are just, you know, they're coming, I think, more and more into the public sort of domain because maybe perhaps um, it's because our, we kind of are, you know, more visual as in general in terms of, uh, you know, media and internet, social media, that we just kind of uh, use these uh, platforms more. I don't know, but I do, I do feel that that's where I would say there's been a, ch a change. And uh, I'm, I'm proof of that myself. My, many of my friends who do the same work are proof of that, that in recent years we've seen that change. But historically speaking, um, as the examples I, I shared with you and many others that uh, we didn't have time to go over, um, like I said, the, the role has been consistent. Thank you. Thank you so much.